Hello and welcome live to the World Crypto Network here live again from the Mises University. And I'm just going to start out with reading a fantastic quote from the amazing Murray Rothbard. He is right up here. Stateless, for if the bulk of the public were really convinced of the illegitimacy of the state, if it were convinced that the state is nothing more nor less than a bandit gang writ large, then the state would soon collapse to take on no more status or breadth of ex existence than another mafia gang. Hence, the necessity of the state's employment of ideologists, and hence, the necessity of the state's age-old alliance with the court intellectuals who waive the apologia for state rule. And that is exactly what is going on in our current society. Yes, we do have many, many state and court intellectuals um, that, well, to be honest, don't really care too much about your personal liberty. All they care about is, well, the state, because the state pays them. And the state makes sure that they have a nice, juicy pension, and the state makes also sure that, uh, well, they have a good job. This guy, Murray Rothbard, from which uh, I just read that quote, guess what? He did not have a government subsidized, uh, subsidized job. He worked in a private university and a really, really small private university. Um, and of course, he started the Mises Institute precisely out of this point, because he did not want to play by the government rules, because he was not a hypocrite. He actually practiced what he preached. And this is exactly what we're talking about here. We stand by hard ideology. We stand by the natural law principle. We do not care about anything that the government tells us. We trust nobody and we always verify for ourselves, just as in Bitcoin. But in Bitcoin, we verify with our full node. In Austrian economics, we verify with our mind, with our logic. And if a government says, for example, well, you need us in order to build roads, then we go, really? Do we need violence? Do we need aggression in order to make a flat surface on the earth? I don't know. I mean, I'm streaming this to you with a, you know, a smartphone and a laptop, and uh, we can do pretty like amazing technology, to be honest. Uh, so do we really need you to make a flat surface? I honestly don't think so. And uh, what we, of course, can also do uh, is give the example of a normal private business, right? If we have, for example, Walmart on the one side and a couple people on the other side, the consumers, and the consumers really, really, really would like to go to Walmart. But there just is not one single road that connects those two. Well, that kind of sucks for Walmart, right? Because now they don't have any customers. And that means that, well, they don't really get any profits. So what will Roth, uh, what, what Roth, Rothbard do? Yeah, what, what would Rothbard do? <laughs> what would Walmart do? They're going to build a road, obviously. And we've actually seen this now with Papa John's. The pizza service was no longer satisfied with the government road system. So they started to fix it themselves. Isn't that amazing? That's just how competition works. And that's how the free market works. It somehow always finds a way. That's the beauty of it. And uh, well, it's amazing, to be honest. So we are here back at the Mises Institute, at Mises University, and uh, it's been so much fun, as always, um, to just talk about economics and get educated about economics. We had fantastic lectures. The last one, from which, by the way, the quote that I read uh, also got mentioned, was by Bob Murphy, called The Stateless Society. And this basically means, well, if we do not like the government, if we think that the government is not that good for us, well, should we probably uh, do something else? Should we probably try to interact freely and peacefully and voluntarily? And that's the study of a stateless economy. It is called agorism. We come together in the agora, in the marketplace, as it was in the old Greek days. But this, a this agora is not just a marketplace for goods and services. No, it is much more a marketplace of ideas and a marketplace of the community that comes together to solve any problem that they really need to solve. So if one of our, uh, if one of our people in the Agora um, maybe doesn't like uh, too much that he's uh, treated 
unfairly, he will come to the Agora and look for a service. For example, uh, he can get a private judge, a judge that is not forced upon him, a judge that does not get his customers by violence and aggression by government monopoly. No, a judge that is just like any other business, a competing and a peaceful comp competing company or, or individual that is providing his services, the law is his service, as a, or against a payment. So the person might just go to the judge and say, hey, uh, I got stolen from, um, you know, Alice, that uh, nasty woman, uh, she stole my television set. And so I would like to uh, get it back. Now, the thing is, Alice is proven innocent until guilty because we do not presume aggression. We do presume the peaceful cooperation. So the judge will say, well, really, did she now actually take your TV without you agreeing to it? Or maybe, uh, did you agree to this exchange and was it a voluntary exchange? Because, well, if yes, then it was a private contract and that's all right, right? Nobody got hurt. And you cannot just take away the contract because then the entire society would fall down. We need private contracts in order to, to organize the resources that we have. So the next argument will be, okay, if you say that Alice has stolen the TV set, can you prove it? Well, there are several ways to prove that. Of course, you know, you might send a detective and do DNA samplings and whatsoever. Kind of complicated, but it is doable. Easy way would just be if Bob has a security camera installed and there is video footage of her actually picking up the television set, looking around, making sure that nobody is seeing her and then walking out of his house. Yeah, now we can pretty much prove that Alice has stolen the property has stolen the television set. And now what the judge can do is he can say, well, okay, I've gathered all the evidence, you know, I've, I've made an educated decision, and I would suggest, I say that this case should be treated according to natural law principle in the following manner. Alice has to return the TV set to Bob, and she has to pay for all the damages. So let's say she has to pay an additional 500 uh, milli bitcoins, so let's say 0 0.005, I think, uh, bitcoins in repayment um, for the trouble of, of Bob. Plus, of course, she has to pay my fee as the judge because I did all the work and obviously she was the wrongdoer. And if she did not have done anything wrong, then Bob wouldn't have come to me. So not really is Bob my, my customer. Yes, he's using my services, but the payment comes from the aggressor. The payment has to come from Alice. So she will also pay the judge for the, for the providing of the service, which is, well, judging the law, judging this case according to the law. But important here, the judge itself might be like an old little fella sitting in his uh, robe in his private office uh, and just doing cases. He is not going to be the one trying to get the stuff from Alice. Why? We have the division of labor. Division of labor means that one individual focuses on one thing, the other individual focus on the another. And well, I guess that's pretty much it already. Uh, cool thing is again here that we have other companies doing something. We have, for example, uh, the institution of a private police or of a private uh, theft return agency or whatever you want to call it. And the job of this theft return agency is that they take this opinion of the judge and they look at it for themselves. Is the judge correct? I mean, we do have his opinion here, but we don't want to aggress against Alice if she actually did a good job. So the, the police agency, the private police agency, uh, by the way, Joe, the guy in the pick, that is the one and only Murray Rothbard. Great guy, great guy. Uh, just a question in the chat. Um, so the private police will judge for themselves if they believe that the opinion of the judge is correct. And they will look back in history. What has the judge said upon, for other cases? Is he just a nut job that, that tries to prosecute people all over the place and tries to destroy their living and tries to steal their property? Well, if so, the police, the, the police agency, the private police, will not take on the judge's opinion. They might say, okay, well, this is one guy's opinion. He's kind of a crazy guy. And we would like to have another judge's opinion before we go out and before we, the police, actually try to take back your property here, Bob. We'll gladly do it. If you want to join, join, right? Okay. Uh, so if you want to 
you know, if, if you want to have our services as the police, um, you have to provide sufficient evidence and a judge ruling um, that we that we deem uh, sufficient before we go out and try to get your property back. Because the thing is, if the if the private police goes out to Ellis and thinks that she stole the property, but then uh, and so they try to take it away from her, and they do. But at the end, it turns out that Alice did not steal it from Bob, that it was Alice television in the first place. Who was the aggressor? Well, the aggressor absolutely was not Bob, not Alice, but the police. And because we as libertarians, we as freedom lovers, are against the aggressive violence of anyone, not just the state, anyone, they have done wrong. They have broken natural law. And this is, by definition, always wrong. So the police agency actually has an incentive to go out and uh, check for themselves if what, they, if what they are doing is correct. Because if they go out there blindly and just, well, do whatever they want and prosecute people left and right, well, most likely they are going to have a pretty bad time because sooner or later, a judge is going to look at them and say, oh, no, 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 you're just going out there and hurting people and taking their stuff. You are aggressing them. I will issue a my judge statement and suggest that you should be prosecuted because you are the aggressor. Then another police agency will look at that case, argue it or judge it for themselves, and they will realize, oh, yeah, actually, uh, they did do a bunch of harm and they did break the law, not the man-made law, the natural law. And therefore, we have to prosecute them. And we have a right to prosecute them with, of course, due diligence by an uh, independent and private judge. On the other hand, if the statement of the judge that Alice stole Bob's TV is actually correct, then Bob can hire the private company to defend his rights. The private company cannot just go out there and steal or, or take, take back Alice or Bob's TV from Alice. Alice if Bob's did not agree to that because well that would actually break the free will of Bob which is against natural law right so the uh, the the private police has to be kind of paid for by the uh, by the uh, Bob by the one who actually got his rights violated because only Bob has a right to self-defense in this case and only Bob has a right to well uh, to the ret retrieval of, the, of his property. But what, what Bob can do with his rights that he controls fully and 100% is kind of sell his rights. He can say, well, I could go to Alice and maybe uh, try to take it away from her, but Alice is really big, you know, she's a strong woman. I'm kind of like a little guy, more of like a nerd, so I don't really have that much muscle power. Um, so she might just whoop my ass, basically. And therefore, I will not personally go there and try to take the TV from him. I will go to a professional, again, division of labor, right? A specialist. And I will pay him to, for a service. And this service is the retrieval of my property, my stolen property. Of course, I will have to pay money for that, obviously, because it's a service. And it's a, non, it's a scarce good, as we talked about, right? Scarce goods have value. And this further means that Bob, with entering in this contract is waiving his right to defend or to take back his property and uh, well he can then uh, yeah just say okay police now you have my permission to take my property back and bring it to me and for the service I will pay you and now I just basically explained how in a free society both a judge system and a police system could work where nobody is being violated, nobody is being aggressed against. We're all working here peacefully together and voluntarily together. And that is the beautiful thing about the free market. There is always, and I repeat, always a solution where we do not need violence. We want to minimize aggression. We want to minimize force. We want to live in a peaceful world, in a prosperous world. And, well, private judges and private police are the way to go. Because with a government, you have to go there um, you have to use them. They are not incentivized that they will do good business with you. They just have to do business with you. So this means that they most likely are really not that much going uh, to provide you a good service. It's going to be a long case. Uh, you know, it's going to be a bunch of fees. It's going to be really inefficient. Um, and by definition, 
they already have stolen from you with taxes. And so you basically have to work with your murder, uh, with your thief that stole already from you to prosecute another thief. So, you know, if, if the institution that should protect you has already stolen from you, do you really think that they will protect you? I don't. For sure I don't. So, Joe, Joey E. Joe, Yoch, I guess. Uh, it's Joe and then Joe backwards. Um, asked in the chat who that guy is. I said, it is Murray Rothbard. And he Googled who Murray Rothbard is. Murray Ru Newton Rothbard was an American heterodox economist, a historian, and a political theorist whose writings and personal influence played a role in the development of modern right libertarianism. I would not say that he played a role. I would say he was the only bastion of hope that we had back in those days. There is a quote of Murray Rothbard that he said that in like the 1960s, around at that time, there were roughly 25 libertarians in the world. There were 25 Austrians in the world fighting for your freedom based on economical judgment and based on logical economical conclusions. But you know what? He didn't care. He continued doing what is right, the natural law. He continued spreading the philosophy of natural law in every aspect of, of life, um, and especially, of course, in economics. But he was not just one of the greatest economists out there to this day. Uh, he also was a phenomenal historian. So, for example, he did a, a phenomenal uh, essay or book, series of books, on the Great Depression, which he clearly, clearly shows that the Great Depression was so severe because it was the first depression where the, the Federal Reserve of America started meddling with the money supply. And they started meddling with the economy, trying to plan everything like communist uh, dictators, pretty much, in the monetary realm. And as soon as they started doing this, things start going south. And things, things start going south really, really soon and really, really horrific. And the people were not used to that. They were not used of having a centralized controlled currency because up to that point, we had the gold standard. The gold standard was pretty, pretty good, pretty much like the Bitcoin standard because, well, uh, it's a censorship resistant, political neutral currency that is limited in its supply. So it is a rare and scarce, non-political neutral currency. And that is fantastic, just like Bitcoin is, guys. So we have, you wanna join? Mm -hmm. no. Okay, <laughs> you can you can go here. No problem. Uh, I'm in the library, so a couple people are around me. Um, maybe someone will join eventually. They're all at lunch, though. Um, so uh, yeah. uh, I guess uh, other people eat. I just want to uh, try to educate you and try to give you here the perspective of the Mises University. So yeah, Rothbard was not just a great economist. Read Man, Economy, and State with Power and Market. It's like this big a book. I think I already quoted out of it. I have to check that. Um, otherwise, I should quote again, because in this book, it is written rather accessible. Of course, it is like deep economics, so it is not that easy to read, um, but you can do it. You know, it's, it's, there's a free audiobook available and a free PDF document available at Mises.org, so nobody's stopping you, obviously. And if you read only one book, read this book and you will understand economics, because he talks about everything in this book. Yeah, he doesn't go into that much detail. Yeah, he's a, quite a radical libertarian. He does not compromise on natural law. He says natural law is the law and everything we do should be governed by it and it is actually governed by it. So it's not even our choice. Uh, we should not hurt people. We should not aggress people in every shape or form. So he was definitely not a guy that believed in minimum government where we need, for example, government to provide a justice system. And as I explained to you, we clearly don't because a justice system works just as fine and I would argue even so, so, so much, much more better than a government justice system that we have right now. I mean, try suing someone. It's a pain in the ass. You're not going to do it. So Joey asks again, is this accent Eastern European? Um, no, actually, I am German. Uh, so I do live in southern Germany. I live at the border to Switzerland, Austria, and Liechtenstein. There's a nice little lake in Central Europe called the Lake of Constance. It's right at the edge of the border to the Alps. A fantastic region, beautiful there. Um, I love the landscape. I don't like the politics because Germany is socialist as hell. Um, Bismarck started with the socialist uh, manifesto, the socialist constitution of Germany, and I think it was 1904. Don't quote me on that number. Um, and yeah, it is uh, pretty much the opposite of freedom what we have there. Truly unfortunate, but I guess that's the state of the world right now uh, that we do live with immense amounts of government control. And uh, 
unfortunately, you know, people like we are going to change this. People here at the Mises University are going to change this. And you know who else is going to change this? TJ. How's it going, guys? Well, I got the microphone working, so that is fantastic. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So we were just talking about the prospects of a stateless society and how we can live without the government. I gave the uh, the uh, example of a stateless society in the Jewish, in the uh, judge system and in the police system. So, what would be another example of how we can live without the government? Uh, well, you also have the option of taking welfare and putting it down to a more voluntary basis through charity. Um, one group that's doing just an absolutely fantastic job is Voluntarism in Action, where they will share um, charitable causes toward, to libertarian groups, make sure that people are aware of the struggles that other people are going through in everyday life and make sure that if they need any assistance, whether that be physical or financial, emotional, in any way, that we have the ability to actually help these people out and say we're going to put our money where our mouth is we believe that voluntary charity works and therefore we are going to focus on making sure that actually happens um which is so incredibly important because the overarching myth of the left is that libertarians are just the way they are because we are greedy capitalists but the fact is that while all human beings are inherently greedy in the context of we want to benefit ourselves Helping others is often a benefit to ourselves as well. And the thing is, with a subjective valuation, we value helping others. So that my charity becomes much more feasible. That we're the ones that are actually helping the most people, in fact. Because the government is absolutely inefficient and, and uh, terrible at choosing who actually should receive help. Absolutely. And the thing is, you know, government the government is taking a lot of money from you every single day. We have so many taxes, and as his hat says, unfortunately you're not wearing it, but what does your hat say? It says uh, taxation is theft. And that's exactly what it is. Why? I define theft as a involuntary payment that is made under the threat of or physical violence itself. And if you define taxation like that, or if you define theft like that, so basically if I'm a robber, you're the person, I hold a gun up to your head and I say, give me your money or I'm going to take your life, that is the threat of violence. If you give me the money, well, I just stolen from you, right? Right. Um, so one thing that's interesting is people will say that, well, taxation isn't theft because you voluntarily give the money over through, like, suppose you're operating on I-9, which is independent contractor status in America. They don't take the taxes originally, but they will, uh, but you hand it over to them afterwards when tax season comes in. But the fact is that we give it because it's under the threat of force. It is still theft. It's not as though you have to unknowingly have this money stolen from you. If that's the case, then, as mentioned, if I just give him my wallet because he has a gun to my head, I didn't give it to him voluntarily. I had two options, either give him my wallet or die. Since I don't want to die, I chose to give him the wallet. So absolutely and because the government is regularly stealing from you you are well not as wealthy as you would have been before the theft obviously right so what are you gonna do now that you have so much less money i mean taxation is horrible it's like 80 percent if you add up all the taxes probably even more if you add inflation which is ta uh, taxation without representation and if you add up all these taxes and you are 80 90 percent less wealthy as with, without the government what are you going to do? Are you going to give even more money away to others? Uh, no, you have to take as much money for yourself because you already work like five, four, five days of the week for the government. So the two, three days of the week that you work for yourself, you have to work even harder because you have to live for the entire seven days of the week, right? So this means that if we have a high taxation, you are incentivized not to provide charity and not to support your community locally. So, yeah, the government kind of takes care of you in a welfare system, kind of, yeah. But I would argue if they would just stop stealing from us, we would have so much more money and so much more wealth and so much more prosperity, not talking about the, uh, the uh, psychological prosperity that we would have without the force of violence and the threat of violence all the time, and that we would be much more charitable. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one one talk here at the Mises University that I'm particularly looking forward to, it's actually happening in about 25 minutes from now. Um, it's Walter Block's fake economic news where they will talk of where he really outlines just recent events and the 
fake economists or the Keynesians, whichever one you want to call them, either way works, um, and what their perspective is and just deconstructs that in its entirety. So one of the things that's interesting is that you have this myth of the Keynesian multiplier effect. Um, and what the multiplier effect basically states is that one dollar of additional government spending leads to five dollars in additional wealth uh, for this for society how does that happen well they really never explain why they just say that well instead of it being saved it's actually being spent on useful tasks and therefore everyone clearly values this what they don't understand is that whenever you're actually curbing sa savings you're uh, you're encouraging greater debt you're encouraging a lack of production we can see that um, ever since uh, the internet came about, we've sort of plateaued in terms of innovation because of government regulation. We've sort of been stuck to where we have this 90s nostalgia because we've really been living in the 90s. There haven't been much cultural innovation since then. So that's one thing that's just interesting to think about is how it actually discourages production. I'd like to know where we would be right now if we didn't have this massive welfare warfare state. Absolutely. The cultural impacts of fiat money, of inflation money, and of government politics is massive. Great lecture on this by a guy that I interviewed just this morning, Jörg Guido Holzmann, is the cultural effects of fiat money. 45 minutes here at the Mises Institute, an amazing lecture. You should watch that. It talks about exactly that. And absolutely, where would we be if we if we not would have stolen from like 90% of our wealth, if we would not live under the constant threat of violence all the time? Just imagine that. Look back. Look back at the at the 18th century, where we had pretty much a global gold standard. This is the century that gave us the steam engine. This is the century that gave us the radio, the television, that gives us that gives us the uh, vaccines. Uh, what else was invented in the 1800s? So much was invented. Beautiful art, beautiful music, and I would argue it's mostly because we had sound money. And well, now we have Bitcoin. Right, and, and this thing is this innovation provides for the ability to have, well, further innovation in many ways. But in addition, you can have a much more leisurely lifestyle. For example, you're talking about art and music that came out of the 19th century. Well, the only reason that happened was because people were able to survive with their means where they didn't have to work at all times just in order to survive. And that's what we're actually coming down to as well. Well, should we have the 40-hour work week? No, there should be no laws pertaining to it. But as innovation comes in, our labor becomes more and more efficient. It becomes more and more productive. And therefore, the need to work actually diminishes slightly. We, can, we will always need labor. We will always need smart labor for that matter. That's what is happening, though, is that, it, that we are getting more autom automation where things have become more more uh, more palpable uh so that's where we we've come in society that's where we need to keep moving toward if we're going to talk about economic efficiency or just the general process of creating more human prosperity which i think is of course the most important thing but one of the greatest obstacles to that i think is war uh the lack of cooperation among individuals around the world simply because of where you're from i believe locals better but by all means i think that these international conflicts must end if we want to propel ourselves into the future. Absolutely, I 100% agree. And we are joined here again by Attila. He joined us last night, so did TJ, as we got an amazing group here. And Joey says in the, uh, in the chat, nice bow tie, and I agree. Come to the Mises University and you will see the most properly dressed young gentlemen that are smart as hell. So if you want to be smart, smart and well dressed, come to the Mises University. So what are your thoughts on the welfare warfare state? No compliment for the hat. <laughs> of course, not the hat is amazing. Come on. <laughs> I just want to say first off, I just had a great, excellent time at lunch meeting with Judge Napolitano, an absolute giant in the liberty movement. Quick, but, quick thing. I talked to Judge right before I started the stream. He will be on the World Crypto Network. So stay tuned. This is going to be fabulous. And get your questions prepared. Oh, when is he coming? Uh, we don't know yet. Probably tomorrow at 4 o'clock. And that's going to be where? Somewhere. I have no idea. Okay, you'll have to let me know. But about the uh, welfare warfare straight. You know, this is something that uh, Dr. Ron Paul talks about a lot, is the uh, connection between... Uh, um, foreign policy and economic policy at home. You know, they're both uh, mutually kind of symbiotic and depend on each other. You know, if we um, if we were to elect Bush versus somewhere like 
Bernie, you know, someone who's a super great expansionist and then someone who's a uh, supposedly a peaceful socialist. Uh, you know, in a socialist regime, it requires control. So it's inevitable for a police state to arise. And from there, you um, it spreads into the foreign policy sector as well. And then uh, that's from where expansionism comes on. And of course, the other way around, if Bush were to set this great uh, warfare state, it has economic consequences, the inflation, the Federal Reserve, uh, with the printing of dollars from thin air. So you can't really isolate uh, one from the other. You can't um, view them as uh, not mutually symbiotic. You have to see them as always linked together. And that's why libertarianism, whether you're anarchist or minarchist, is the most consistent position. Because um, if you support the warfare state, but not any you're a capitalist, that, well, that doesn't make sense because uh, in the end, the warfare state will uh, end up uh, implementing socialism of some sort. And the other way around, um, if you support the welfare state, that'll end up uh, later down the line uh, turning into a giant expansionist state. <clears throat> so the only consistent position is libertarianism because it puts into consideration these two aspects and kind of uh, shows how greatly they influence each other and how important they are and how they're so greatly linked. So. Yes, absolutely. I 100% agree. And the problem with the welfare state is that it's really, really expensive uh, because, well, it's a Ponzi scheme. And in order to keep a Ponzi scheme running, you need additional money all the time because, well, eventually you're going to run out, right? How are you going to take that money? There are two ways, to three ways the government can do it. First, the government can be productive. Have you ever seen a productive bureaucrat? No, you have not because they do not exist. Number two, they can steal the money via taxation. That is, they can go to someone, point a gun at their face, say, give me your money or I will take your life. Then they take the money. That, yeah, they do that, obviously. But actually, if you do that a lot of time, people realize that the welfare state is not that nice. So the most prevalent way that they use my, or that, that they use to finance the welfare state is via inflation, which again is taxation, but without representation. So the average Joe doesn't even know that he's being robbed from. He just realized that prices are all of a sudden a bit more expensive. But that is basically what happens in inflation, right? And so what do we have to fight the welfare warfare state? Bitcoin and gold, because we have a sound money that is politically neutral censorship resistant and unchangeable that applies both for bitcoin and for gold but with bitcoin because gold is not that useful of a currency especially in the digital world nevertheless gold is a damn good currency much much better than the dollar or the euro but in the digital world it's not as useful maybe with tokenization we don't know that yet let's see where the market takes us we don't know but bitcoin is the money for the digital age and it is founded on the principles of liberty and austrian economics and it is sound money so guess what? If this amazingly well, sound, well done sound money is super useful, and if it is used by many, many people, and if it turns into the prevalent money used in the society, because there is one tendency, uh, there's a tendency towards one natural money, uh, that might be Bitcoin, we don't know it, but if it is, we have a sound money that the government cannot use to print more of. And this means this instantly eliminates the biggest funding mechanism of the government, which is inflation. And so with Bitcoin or with gold or with any other sound money that will take away the power from the government, that will break the monopoly of the government on money, that will bring us to freedom and move away away from the uh, welfare warfare state. Sure. Um, just sort of looking into warfare, for example, I think that that's actually an um, incredibly important issue now. Um, the uh, Helsinki summit ended and while the media is bombarding President Trump over his willingness to have diplomacy with Vladimir Putin rather than start the Cold War II or starting even World War III, he opted to actually have a conversation instead. And I think that's actually tremendous because we weren't we haven't seen that in years. It's the it's the it's the boomer myth um, that Russia and Cuba and North Korea will always be our enemies. Now, mind you, Trump is very much wrong 
about what he has done with Cuba in terms of reversing relations with the normalization of relations that President Obama, I'm on my own, uh, that President Obama managed to do. But what is important here is to realize that with terms of North Korea or Russia, they're actually doing the right thing. And I find that I find it incredible, honestly. Um, the, the, to where even the entire left is given into the neoconservative myth that America must be this worldwide empire. Oh, the walkaway movement. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing I think that that's actually helping with the walkaway movement is that people are done with this sick and done and sick and tired of this duopoly to where you have people like Chuck Schumer, or Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi and Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell all saying that the president was wrong to talk here. This isn't so much an endorsement of the president. There's plenty of things that he's done wrong as well. But He's right on this in terms of foreign policy. The diplomacy is far better than warfare. Here you go. So, okay. Thank you so much, guys. Well, uh, where can the people find you? Did you tell them? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, you can find me at freedomeconomics.org. I'm the uh, co-founder of the Liberty Institute of Freedom and Economics. And this is actually uh, Mason Mohan, and you should definitely get to know him. He is a very young man who has started a new libertarian news outlet that I feel is the future of the journalism model. Hello, yes, as he said, I am uh, Mason Mohan. I am the co-founder of 71 Republic and current director of content and COO. Um, we take, our site's goal is to spread news that the mainstream media doesn't look at, that they just kind of forget about, stuff that's important to people that care about liberty abridgments of liberty that the government does or that corporations do that people just kind of like forget about or never ever find out about because the mainstream media doesn't report on this and then also like even though it's controversial promote third parties like such as the libertarian party and spread cryptocurrency news that is fantastic and then you're exactly at the right, right place right here because we are the world crypto network we are a loose combination of several different content creators that thought well the mainstream media is definitely not going to provide good quality content about Bitcoin. Hell no, they won't. So guess what? We're going to do it. And with the power of the internet, with the power of non-scarce goods, we can reach an audience of 60,000 subscribers. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for putting this thumbs up. Thank you for donating to the World Crypto Network. And we provide a plethora of content that will actually educate people on Bitcoin. And just as I'm trying to educate those people that are already well-versed in Bitcoin because the World Crypto Network has been around since, I think, 2012, 2014. I'm not exactly sure, but it's been a long, long time. And uh, they, would you like to join us? One second. Well, and, and yeah, if we start walking away, that's because we see like the best professors walking just past and we're trying to get them on here. So there's Tom Woods, Joseph Solarna, that was just Walter Block walking by. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, well. Fake news is tremendously huge. And the censorship that we have in news is tremendously huge. Tremendous. And uh, what can we do against that? And especially combined with the censorship that we have in the internet. Well, we like to take a non-biased approach to all of our news. Like, of course, the places we're going to look for news to report on are definitely places that matter more to libertarians. But when we tell this story, it's going to be the story from both sides. It's going to be like, this is the intention of this piece of legislation that was passed. These are the unintended consequences, things like that. Um, and as a small site, I mean, there's not much we can do when it comes to censorship by big corporations such as Facebook and Google, like just like many other libertarian medias, um, we've fallen victim to that censorship too. Not quite as much as others have, but when it gets down to it, like there's always alternative ways to promote and alternative ways to communicate. And that's why events like this, like the uh, Mises University are important because like these big corporations don't like libertarians. So we got to find each other at stuff like this. So yeah. Absolutely. And that's why the Mises Institute is such a great inspirational organization or institute because, well, they have been fighting this fight since Rothbard started it. That guy. Yep. In 1983, 1982. Yes. Um, it's been amazing. They really fight for your liberty, regardless who you are, regardless where you live. 
And that's all that they do. They provide education because this is not a war with weapons, although it maybe will turn into one. We do not know that. But most importantly, this is a war of the mind. This is a war of ideas and a war of culture. And if we have censorship and if we have government control in the universities and in the education, if you want to call it university stuff education, which it definitely is not, um, then, yeah, we have a big problem. Because the government can indoctrinate and can control the masses and tell them, hey, wait, actually, the government is really nice. Taxation is actually good for you because we use the money for the welfare state, which is even better for you. Oh, yeah. And uh, inflating the money supply is really good because, well, we have a stable currency then. Um, really? The dollar has lost 98% of its value since 100 years? <laughs> um, so absolutely, we need to break the monopoly off by the government in education. And what are your thoughts, for example, on homeschooling? Well, I was homeschooled for a couple of years myself, so I mean, and I think I've turned out well. I mean, I'm 17 and I started a libertarian organization, but like, yeah, homeschooling is great. And when it gets down to it, like the government, they have these kids like take all these civics classes that only tell one side of the story. And they have, um, they have all these, uh, like, I mean, pretty much every course is going to be geared towards pro-government economics classes are going to be like it's okay for there to be tariffs in one place or another um, they have the kids say the pledge every day and when it gets down to it it's all about having support for the government because as every great austrian economist is going to tell you and every great like libertarian sociologist they're all going to tell you the government needs the support from the public to exist and rothbard talked about an anatomy of the state there's like plenty of ways for them to get this support one of which is the education system i don't know if he specifically mentioned that one but that's that, that's definitely something i've written about and that's definitely one that exists if you want to find out what this great man has thought about the educational system, there's a little pamphlet that is called Education, Free or Compulsory, where he basically goes exactly into that. And his argument is that we are all human beings. We are individual and beautiful creatures that are conscious, right? And we are all different. And this means that if you have an education system that forces you to take on a schedule of education, that is not tailored to you, but this, that is tailored to the masses, this is not going to help you. This is not going to educate you. It's just going to give you trivia, stuff that is need to know. But this approach of learning is not teaching the trivium, which is the art of learning to the art of learning stuff. So you're not being taught stuff. You actually learn it for yourself because the trivium means basically you get information that is external. You take that in, you try to understand it. That is an internal process in your mind, heart, and gut. And then once you've understood the information, you act upon it. And the action of actually living in accordance with the trivium and living with accordance to the natural law is wisdom. That is what wisdom is. And action is so important. Look at him. He's 17. I'm sure you've read a bunch of books. I'm sure you're really educated in the subject. But you don't just sit in your basement and read books. No. You understand the information that you take in with books, and then you act upon them. You start with, the, with this network of amazing news, and that is exactly what we need. Not students that just read there like the sheeple and, and do everything that they're told. No, free humans that act upon the truth. Yeah, I mean, essentially everything he just said is like perfect. Like, these ideas are worthless if you don't act on them. Um, and yeah, I think that's extremely important. Yes, uh, unfortunately, we already have to go because the next lecture is happening in just a few minutes. And it's Walter Block. It's Walter Block. I mean, come on, guys. If you haven't heard of Walter Block, um, pretty much any question you have, he has written five articles about it. At least. It's crazy. So we definitely have to get him on this show here at the World Crypto Network. And the next lecture, which you can watch for free online at YouTube, Mises Media, or at Mises.org, is called fake economic news so basically just what we talked about it's his main subject that i'm sure you're going to be excited about hearing that lecture and i'm sure you're going to have a bunch of questions afterwards so if we have the chance to getting walter block on there i have like ten thousand questions i want to ask him but if you're there also you can ask him questions about that so thank you guys for supporting us here at the world crypto network at worldcryptonetwork.com and thank you for providing maybe a little donation or just your time 
for the Mises Institute that this great man founded, Murray Rothbard, and just, you know, get educated. The stuff here is all for free. Non-scarce goods should be free because there is no property rights in them. And uh, this means that they share a bunch of news and a bunch of articles, a bunch of books, audiobooks, and so on and so on. So please support those two amazing institutes. Um, my personal stuff you can find on towardsliberty.com slash Bitcoin for a library on Bitcoin slash economics for a library in Austrian economics and slash anarchy if you want to find out about my paper, which I'm writing for my bachelor thesis called Anarchy and Money, why we neither need nor want government regulation in Bitcoin. So that's going to be a fun one. So again, what is your name? Well, your name is Mason, but where can the people find you? Mason Mohan, 71republic.com. Perfect. Check him out. He's a great young guy. And check out the Mises Institute Raw Crypto Network. And we're going to see you on the next show as soon as possible. But now to the lectures.